Okay, uh, uh, I am still traumatized today. I'm trying to get past it, trying to move past it. But what happened was uh, over over the weekend, we were we were going to load the kayak into uh, the truck so we could bring it to the lake so I could fish in the kayak. One of my favorite things to do is to go fishing in a kayak, um, and uh, which is really just means that I'm too cheap to buy a boat. But we were about to load it in the in the in the truck, and then we noticed a spider in the kayak, and it was not just any spider, it was a black widow spider, which had laid, there was an egg sac, there was a black widow spider um, and an egg sac in the kayak. Now, that's literally my nightmare. I mean, in a very literal sense, that is my nightmare. That is my worst case scenario. Well, I guess worst case scenario is that we don't notice it. I get into the kayak, uh, and then I'm out in in the, the lake, and then the black widow spider jumps out and tries to bite me in the eyeballs. That's the worst case. This is, this is like very close to the worst case scenario. And anyway, um, what could I do then in that situation aside from burn the kayak, burn the truck, burn my house, burn myself? I jumped into the fire myself. I look pretty good afterwards considering. And um, so now I can never kayak again and I can never walk out of my house ever again. Now, you might say that it's very girly of me to react this way to a spider. Uh, I am terrified of spiders, I admit. But I would respond to that in two ways. Number one, how dare you, sexist. Number two, spiders are actually demons. They are from hell. They they crawled out of the cracks in the ground from hell. And that's, I mean, it's in the Bible. That's It's it's right there. So am I girly because I don't want to be around demon spiders? Am I girly because I don't want them to crawl into my ears and eat my soul as spiders are known to do? No, that's just called taking precautions. Okay. That is, that's called knowing the science. All right. I'm going to try to move past this and talk about other things today uh, as best I can to to overcome the trauma. And what we're going to do is, to begin with, um, I want to talk about something that if you're a diehard Trump supporter, a diehard Trump fan, you're probably not going to like. But I think you especially need to hear it. So I hope you I hope you stick through and bear with me so we can have this conversation. But first, before we get into that, a word from our friends at Noom. Um, you know, getting in shape is not just about losing weight. It's uh, it's about learning healthier habits, feeling better about yourself, whether that's more stamina so you can kind of keep up with your with your busy life, keep up with the kids, keep up with your job, um, or if it's getting into the, 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 the jeans you've wanted to wear, being more in tune with your body's needs, whatever it is, that's what it's about. The great thing about Noom is that it can help you in a very personalized kind of specific way, no matter your situation or your health or your fitness goals, whatever it is. So for me, in my very specific situation, it's been great because I'm immobilized for the most part with my um, Achilles injury. And now I'm even more immobilized because of my fear of spiders. And so that means I can't do a lot of the kind of cardio stuff I like to do usually. And that's where the more well-rounded approach by Noom helps out, keeps me from becoming a blimp as I am, uh, as I am you know, uh, incapacitated in some ways. So I really need to focus on eating healthy and developing good habits, and Noom has been great for that. Noom is a habit-changing solution that helps users learn to develop a new relationship with food through personalized courses. This is based in psychology. Noom is all about kind of teaching you why you do the things that you do, which will then help you break bad habits and form good ones. Noom is, it's not just a diet, it's 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 a healthy and easy to stick to way of life. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make the big difference. Sign up for your free trial uh, today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash Walsh. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make a big difference. So sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash Walsh. What do you have to lose? Visit Noom.com slash Walsh to start your trial today. That's Noom.com slash Walsh, the last weight loss program you're going to need. Okay, now for a conversation that is um, sure to upset Trump's biggest fans, I think. But it's a conversation that if if you're in that group, uh, I think, as I said, you need to be a part of. First, though, let's kind of set the stage. We'll back up. Last week was a pretty disastrous week for the Democrats. As we discussed last week, AOC basically insinuated, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez basically insinuated that Nancy Pelosi is racist, accusing her of, uh, quote, singling out women of color in Congress, which is not so much an insinuation of racism as it is an outright accusation of racism. 
And then Pelosi responded, and their supporters and, and the different factions have been going back and forth, eating each other alive. It's been very ugly. Ugly if you're a Democrat. If you're you know, not a Democrat, if you're a conservative, it's kind of beautiful to watch your opponents eat themselves. And then over the weekend, um, so that was what happened last week. The Democrats spent last week eating each other, um, cannibalizing, you know, their own party. And then we get to the weekend and over the weekend, left-wing extremists have been themselves going out of their way to expose themselves as the anti-American militants that they really are. There was, there were, there were two moments. Um, first there was this moment. Watch this. Those are leftist protesters at an ICE facility in Colorado ripping the American flag down and replacing it with a Mexican flag. And I have to tell you, I'm very glad they did this. I'm not glad to see the, 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 the flag disrespected, but I'm glad, um, I'm always glad when leftist radicals expose themselves as the radicals they are. I'm glad when they make their true intentions known. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for the truth to be shown and for people to see it. They really do hate this country, and they really do want to bring illegal immigrants in here in order to upend and destroy our country. That's very clear. I mean, that's that's what that the symbolism there means. When you tear down an American flag and replace it with a Mexican flag, that's what you're doing. And then also on Saturday, um, something I was not glad about because of, of the violence and, and the fact that someone died in the process, um, an Antifa terrorist waged an attack at an ICE facility in Washington State. He came with explosive devices. Um, a gun, and he was eventually. Thank God he didn't. He didn't succeed in hurting anybody at the ICE facility, but he himself was uh, shot and killed by police. This is an incident that should get a lot of attention. Now we know that the the, the main the leftist media is going to ignore it, but this is, you know, it, it someone deeply affiliated with and involved in Antifa. Uh, someone who's been arrested in the past who's going now with a gun and uh, incendiary devices and attacking a government facility. I mean, Antifa is a terrorist organization, and that is becoming increasingly clear. And they themselves, the Antifa members, are increasingly um, less shy about you know, acting like terrorists and exposing themselves as terrorists. So we should be talking about that. We should be talking about the flag thing. We should be talking still about Democrats you know, the, the infighting and everything. But we haven't been talking much about that this weekend um, because instead we've been talking about Donald Trump's tweeting. Uh, Donald Trump has a policy, it seems, where he will not let his enemies destroy themselves for very long. You know, it, it, when, when his enemies are destroying themselves, Donald Trump just compulsively needs to jump in and say, no, 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 put some of the negative spotlight on me. I don't know. I'm not going to let you guys make idiots of yourselves. Okay. I'm still here. Um, he needs to bring the spotlight, the negative spotlight back on himself. He is constantly, constantly, constantly bailing out his opponents by saying dumb stuff that gives them an excuse to change the subject and get back to talking about him in a negative way. Constantly. He's constantly doing it. And he did it again in a big way this weekend. Um, Referring to what is annoyingly now, I guess, called the squad. I mean, you couldn't think of a more annoying name for these uh, for 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 this collection of people. But the um, the freshman Democratic representatives who have been warring with Pelosi lately and who have been you know getting all the just sucking all the air out of the room and, and getting all the attention. It's um, uh, Ilhad Omar, um, uh, Alexandra Casa Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, and uh, Ayan. Uh, Ayanna Presley. Okay, those are the sort of the four um, representatives that are in this unofficial group now. And referring to them, Trump tweeted this. He said, "So interesting to see progressive Democrat Congresswomen who originally came from countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt, and inept anywhere in the world, if they even have a functioning government at all." Now loudly and viciously telling the people of the United States, the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, how our government is to be run. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came? 
Then come back and show us how it's done. These places need your help badly. You can't leave fast enough. I'm sure that Nancy Pelosi would be very happy to quickly work out free travel arrangements. Um, that last line about Nancy Pelosi makes it very clear who he's referring to. There's no way around it. He's referring to the congresswomen who Nancy Pelosi has been at odds with. And those are the four that I mentioned. So there you have it. He is telling minority women to go back where they came from. Uh, it's just, that's what's happening here. There's no way around it. He said it's, it's right in there. I mean, you, you could try to deny it. It's not what he said. We can all read it. It's right there. We know what he said. That is what he said. Plain as day. Um, and we should also mention, to make matters worse, that only one of the four women is foreign-born. Omar is is foreign-born, but the others were born in the United States. So, you know, some Trump fans have tried to bail out the president by saying, oh, no, he was only referring to Omar, uh, not the other ones. Well, that's nonsense. He said women. That's plural. He, and, he, and he's continued to tweet on this subject, uh, uh, just c- continuing to, to keep it, you know, t- to make sure that we continue talking about it. And he's, he always talks about it in a plural. He's not, he's not just talking about Omar. He's talking about all four of them. It's very, very clear. Now, again, as a Trump fan, you could deny it. You can tell each other and yourselves, ah, that's not what he meant. But everybody else knows what he meant. And no matter what you say, you're not going to change what other people know to be true. You see, that, that's the problem. So he is, he is also telling people who were born in this country to go back where they came from. Now, the other um, rationalization I've heard from some Trump fans is they say, oh, no, he wasn't saying go back to the countries where they originally came from or where their families came from, uh, but go back to their districts as Congress people. Go back and fix it. <laughs> he said countries. He literally said countries. He started the thing by talking about countries they came from, and then he said go back. So clearly, yes, he is telling these people who are, again, only one of them is actually foreign born to go back where they came from. You can't get around it. You just can't. It, and it is, uh, he's telling minority women to go back where they came from, which is a mon- monumentally stupid thing to say. Such an absolutely dumb, ridiculous, idiotic, unforced error that can only hurt him and the Republicans and conservatives. It cannot do anything good. There's nothing good that can come of it. Period. Not surprised by it, because Trump, as I said, is constantly doing this kind of thing. He's constantly getting his message across in the worst possible way and stepping on every landmine in the process and seemingly determined to make sure that he confirms all of the worst things that he is that that that, that his that his enemies say about him. Um, this tweet, like so many of Trump's tweets, is a gift. To Omar, Cortez, all the guys, all the Democrats, it is it is like it's like a Christmas present that he wrapped up and handed them and said, "Here you go." It takes the focus off of them. It gives them reason to unite. They were they were at each other's throat. Now they're united. Now they're back together again, and it's, it's a happy go lucky. And you know they're in this fight together. So that's not good. It's better when they're fighting. It's you don't want them together united. Um. It gives them a chance to take a righteous stand and stand against racism and ethnocentrism. It gets them all that. It gives them campaign material, fodder. It's it's just, it is, as I said, a gift. Now, look, I don't think that Trump is racist. I, I've said that many times. Um, Trump, no, he's not. See, his enemies either knowingly um, misrepresent him, which, of course, we know they do. Or they just really don't under. I think it's kind of a com- combination. They also, I think there are a lot of people, his fans included, actually, who really just don't understand somehow what he's all about. No, I think Trump is very easy to read. He's a very, you know, he's a very simple person to understand what makes him tick. So is he racist? No, Trump just says stuff. That, that, that's what he, he says. Whatever will get him attention. He doesn't hate people based on race. He likes anyone who likes him. Reg- Period. If if you like him and say something nice about him, he will like you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, and uh, and if you criticize him, he hates you. I, that's that's as simple as that. It's race doesn't factor in. Gender doesn't factor in. A political party doesn't factor in. Nothing factors in. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's that simple. Um, it's also true that the left and and uh, and you know Democrats, leftists. They're going to call people racist regardless. They're going to call their enemies racist regardless. I get called racist all the time. 
erroneously, but I get called it. It, it, It's just a word that the left throws around. um, And uh, it is a word that, that talk about unforced stupid errors on their part. They have taken this accusation, which, um, which could have a lot of force to it and used to have a lot of force, but now it doesn't have as much because they use it way too often and they call everything racist. And the thing is when you call everything racist and then you actually stumble across a racist thing, it's going to be harder for you to condemn it or to, or to have people take your condemnation seriously because you're, it's the boy who cried wolf thing, boy who cried racism, right? So, uh, yes. So I, th- those two things should be stipulated. Fine. Um, with that said, however, the fact is he told minority women to go back where they came from. And it is really, 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 really easy to credibly paint that as a racist comment. Now, here's the nuance here. Again, you know, if you're a Trump fan, you're going to say, oh, he's, he's not racist. But it, fine. It is clearly very, very easy, though, to take a comment like that and present it, uh, uh, you know, argue that it is racist. Now, yes, they do that with every comment, sure but you don't have to hand it to them on a silver platter. Okay, you don't have to do that. You don't have to put yourself in a situation where you're trying to argue, no, 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 you could tell minorities to come back where they came from and it's not racist. Let me explain why. That's a losing conversation. That's not a winner. And it's stupid. Why? We don't need to talk about that. That's not the point. That's what frustrates me so much. It, 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 you know, People say, oh, well, you know, he's, he's, he's talking about immigration. He's like, okay, let's talk about that. We don't need to have a conversation about, well, is it technically racist to tell people? No, that's not the freaking point. You think that it's helpful to have that conversation? You think it, you think it, it will get our point across better? You think we're more likely to um, bring people to our side when we're, when we're trying to you know, have the conversation through that lens? Um, I mean, it's like the thing where he said, uh, you know, there are fine people on both sides. After the uh, neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville. Now, Trump fans, again, will are very quick to point out that, uh, that if you look at it in context, that's, that's not what he said. He wasn't referring to the neo-Nazis. He was trying to say that there were other people there who were not neo-Nazis who were there for other reasons and, and, and that they could be fine people. I get that. Okay, I, yes, that's true. You look at it in context. But is, it was still a stupid thing to say. It's, we, we don't want to have to sit here and explain why... Well, yeah, you could say there are fine people on both sides in reference to a mostly neo-Nazi rally, and it's not technically racist. That might be true, but it's a losing conversation. It's a loser. It's just there's no reason to say it. He should have just not said it. Um, and it's not because, uh, you know, every time I talk about this, people say, oh, you just want to be politically correct. Oh, come on. I mean, you know, you know me, right? I'm not politically correct. I could care less about political correctness. I say things every day that are as as far from politically correct as humanly possible, and I have the death threats and the the death wishes and the hate mail and the, everything imaginable to prove it. Okay, I've told you about it on the show. I've had people wish death and and worse on my family, on my children, on me. It's a normal occurrence for me. Um, death wishes, death threats. I mean, all that stuff. Okay. Because I don't care about political correctness, and because I, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to engage on issues, so I don't care about that. That's not my point. Um, but if I'm talking to minorities and we're debating something, I'm not going to say, "Go back where you came from," uh, because I'm politically correct. No, it's just an incredibly stupid way of getting your point across. And you're going to lose it. Once you say something like that, you lose. Any chance you had of of conveying your message and actually getting it across is gone because you said that. Okay. Um, There is a, there is a, now I do think you can say something like, and I have said things like, generally speaking, not targeted at minorities, but just in general, look, if you hate America that much, if you think it's a terrible country, then you can leave, Right. I've said that about Colin Kaepernick. Um, 
But there's a very clear difference, actually, between saying, look, if you hate America, you can leave, and saying, go back where you came from. So very clear difference between those two statements. Very clear. And anyone who cannot see the difference shouldn't be in politics. If you can't see the difference between those two things, you are not nearly politically savvy enough to be in politics. Now, Trump fans will still try to pretend that the president tells it like it is and you know says the things that other people are afraid of saying. That's not it. Okay? I mean, at this point, guys, you, you, you got to see the reality for what it is. Um, it's just, it's the same thing when, when uh, you, you still hear people trying to claim that Trump is playing some sort of brilliant game of 3D chess and this is all a political strategy and, oh, it's so, it's, it's so, you know, subliminal and subtle and yet it, it's so, the guy's a genius. No, no. I mean, by now you must realize what's going on here. He, he, he watches Fox and Friends, especially on the weekend. And he just tweets and thinks out loud on the internet. That's it. That's all. It's, I mean, it, it like a lot of people on Twitter, except he's the president. It's the, that's the that's the difference here. Now you could say about me, oh, well, you run your mouth on Twitter all the time. True, I do. But I'm not the president, though. You see, I, 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 I'm just paid to run my mouth. That's that's my whole job. I'm not paid to run the country. I am paid to run my mouth. And it's a, and it could be a fun job. And, you know, we can argue about whether or not it's a very useful job, but um, regardless, that's my job. I like to think the president, his job is bigger than that, more than that. And even as someone who's paid to run my mouth, even I wouldn't say half of the stuff that he says on Twitter, again, not because I'm afraid, not because I'm politically, but because it's stupid to say and will achieve nothing positive at all, period. Um, So, okay, here's here's the point. We got to move on. Um, When it comes to the tweeting, if, if if you are a diehard fan, you love the tweets, great, fine. I mean, you're, you're entitled to love the tweets. I'm not telling you not to. You can think whatever you want, right? But most people in the country are not diehard Trump fans. And there aren't enough of you to reelect him in 2020. It's, it's just not enough. Now, he won in 2020 with 3 million fewer vote, voters. And he did it because he was running against Hillary Clinton, who's the most unlikable and corrupt uh, political candidate in modern American history. She didn't campaign in the Rust Belt, amazingly. Um, she was being investigated by the FBI during the campaign. Um, uh, he was a novelty at the time, uh, which, which, which really counts for something. And his, the people who didn't like him, his opponents didn't take him seriously enough as a threat. And so they didn't show up in places like Detroit and Philadelphia. Um, it's a lot of these urban centers. There was a depressed voter turnout, partly because they thought, ah, he's going to lose anyway. We don't have to take him seriously. Well, as soon as he won, they realized that, oh, wait, okay, that was a mistake. And then that's why it was it was just a few weeks later after he was inaugurated, or, or was it a few weeks before, I don't remember, uh, where you had the Women's March, and you had a million people out, and they were, you know, freaking out about Trump. Now, and, and we all said at the time, okay, it's a little late for that. You people should have been there. You know, if you, if you really were that worried about Trump, maybe you should have showed up at the ballot box, and you didn't. They're not going to make that mistake again. They won't. You can't count on it. You cannot count on on, on Trump's opponents and the people who hate him not showing up again. They will show up. So all those things I just listed, those are benefits he is not going to have anymore. Those are gone. It's a different day. It's a different year. Different. Which, which yet again emphasizes that he's going to need um, to expand his coalition. Now, he won with what? It was a 60 or 61 million voters last time. Yeah, it's all about the Electoral College, right? But it, it also you also need bodies. You need warm bodies. That's how you get the Electoral College votes. So he won with that amount last time. Um, that same amount isn't going to be enough this time. And it's arguable, it, it's, it's doubtful whether he could even get that the same amount again. But you have to ask, what has he done to expand the base, to get more people in? And don't just tell me, oh, the economy's doing fine. Who cares? I got news for you. Most people don't vote based on the economy. That Whatever anyone says, it's not true. Most people don't. Most people, they're not looking at the freaking stock market before they go to the polls. Um, 
No, what has he done in terms of his communicating, in terms of his, you know, on a very human level, right? What is he doing to expand, to bring more people in? Because running his mouth on Twitter, the same way he did in 2015 and 2016, does that represent an attempt to bring more people in, to appeal to more people? Are these tweets going to appeal to, to more people? No. That's the problem. You know, they've done surveys on this. The vast majority of Americans have a negative view of the tweeting. And if they did a survey on that particular tweet, I guarantee you the majority are going to say, I don't like it. Now, they might not all freak out and say it's racist, but you know, at, at best, they're going to say, uh, that was stupid. At worst, they're going to say he's a bigot, racist clan member, right? That's kind of the scale you're getting. When you say stuff like that, that's the, the best you can hope for is for people to say, ah, oh, that's stupid, but I'll try to look past it. And that's what Twitter has become. It's become a thing where at best people look past it. It's not a net positive anymore. And here's how I know it, and then we'll move on. Here's how I know that it's not an, it's not a net positive. Because um, I think we all know, and I talk to people like this all the time, People who are kind of more in the middle politically, they like some of Trump's pol- policies. In fact, po- policy-wise, he's, he's, he's better than they thought he would be. Um, so they like some of his policy. They don't like some others, but they're kind of like, you know, they don't like the Democrats either. And so there's a lot of people in that realm. Don't like Democrats, not diehard Republicans, not diehard Trump fans. They, they like some of his policies. They're with him on, some, on most of the immigration stuff. They're with him on the gun rights stuff. They're with him on, you know, foreign policy. Um, but they really hate the tweets and they re- they, his whole act, his whole shtick, they just hate it. They don't like it. They, they, they are turned off by it. They're all, and, and so there are a lot of people in that camp. Now, some of them are going to overlook it and vote for him anyway. Great. But not all of them will. There, there are going to be some who say, you know what? I just, I can't vote for him. I'm going to stay home. He just, he, I, I'm just so sick of it. Or maybe they'll vote against him. Who knows? Um, You might not agree with that. Fine. But those people exist. That's a political reality. So we know those people exist. I talk to them all the time. I know they exist. Do you think there's anyone who the same sort of thing where they say, yeah, you know, uh, uh, I I, I like or, or, you know, let's look at it. They they kind of are iffy on his policies. I I don't know. They're They're sort of in the middle, but they just love the tweets. It's like, give me more tweets. I love this stuff, man. And so they're going to be more inclined to vote for him because of the tweets. You think there's anyone in that category? If you're a diehard fan, you're not in that category. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about people who are not diehard, yet are going to be more compelled to vote for him because of the tweeting. I think we all know there's nobody in that category. There are a lot of people who maybe would vote for him are less are, are, are less excited about it because of the tweets. There's nobody who are a maybe, but are more excited because of the tweets. And so that tells us that it's just, it's a, it's, it's not good. Politically, it's not good. And he's killing himself and he's giving gifts to the Democrats. And if you, if you really are a Trump supporter, and if you really hate the Democrats, and you don't want them in, in control. You, you got to stop encouraging this stuff because it's not helping. All right. Um, Let's see. What else do we want to talk about? Let's go back. Um, let's go back briefly. And uh, I, I talked about the Democrats embarrassing themselves. Let's look at one of the embarrassing Democratic moments that Trump has so helpfully distracted us from. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, at a hearing on Friday, uh, tried to take the former head of, of ICE to task. In fact, before we play that clip, it's a great clip. Um before we play that, actually, she so she was uh, she was at this hearing, and first of all, she insisted on being sworn in, even though she was told, "Well, you don't need to swear swear people swear in. We don't swear people in for this." She insisted on it, and why did she insist on being sworn in? Well, because she stood up there, and uh, she you know she had her she had her hand up, and she had this you know that kind of like innocent, but, but sort of innocent deer in the headlights, but also determined sort of facial expression that AOC does all the time. So she's standing there with that facial expression with her hand up. And the reason why she insisted on being sworn in, even though it wasn't necessary is so just so she could get that picture. And just so that now she knew that, um, 
she's going to get that picture of herself with her hand up. And then every news article about the hearing is going to have that picture attached to it. Which means that, okay, now she looks determined and serious and it's a nice little picture. And also it makes it about her. Now, I I think that that's a, a disingenuous tactic. I think using you know using a swearing in as a as a you know as a political ploy like that is detestable. It actually that's actually taking the Lord's name in vain. That's actually what taking the Lord's name in vain means. When you swear by something but you don't mean it, you're doing it in vain. So I don't like it, but it's politically savvy. Now, see, that's what a politically brilliant move looks like. And AOC, I I don't like her. I mean, I think her policy-wise, I absolutely oppose everything she's ever said or suggested policy-wise. And as a person, I think she's dishonest. I think she's she's uh, she's a, a race baiter. Um, I, you know, I, I just I don't like her as a person. I don't think she's a good person. But she 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 is politically savvy, and that. Was a was a pretty brilliant move. See, that's the kind of thing Trump needs to be doing. Not that exact thing, but things that are going to make you look good. Things that you know, I just where you think about how this is going to be perceived and viewed by the general public, not just your diehard fans, but just the average person who doesn't follow politics that closely. And the average person who doesn't follow it, they're going to see the picture of AOC with her hand up, and they're going to think, oh, that's a very, oh, it's like a very honest and straightforward person who's you know, swearing in and is going to tell the truth. That's what the sort of just average oblivious person is going to think. Trump needs to be doing a lot more to appeal to that type of person. Or he's going to lose. Okay. Um, so she, uh, that was a fine little stunt. But then the problem is you could do the stunt for the picture but then, yeah, then it comes time for the actual substance, and that's where uh, AOC falls apart. And so here she is. Uh, you could tell she she thinks she's got him, but she doesn't. Watch this. Mr. Holman, your name is on this. Is this correct? Yes, I signed that memo. So you are the author of the family separation policy. I am not the author of this memo. You're not the author, but you signed the memo. Yes, a, so, zero, a zero tolerance memo. So you provided the official recommendation to Secretary Nielsen on family, for the United States to pursue family separation. I gave Secretary Nielsen numerous recommendations on how to secure the border and save lives. But it says here that you, re you gave her numerous options, but the recommendation was option three, family but, separation. What I'm saying, this is not the only paper where we've given the Secretary numerous options to secure the border and save lives. And so the recommendation of the many that you recommended, you recommended family separation. I recommend a zero tolerance. Which includes family separation. The same as is whenever a U.S. citizen parent gets arrested when they're with a child. Zero tolerance was interpreted as the policy that separated children from their If parents. I get arrested for DUI and I have a young child in a car, I'm going to be separated. When I was a police officer in New York and I arrested a father for domestic violence, I separate that Mr. Holman, with all due respect, legal asylees are not charged with any crime. When you're in the country illegally, it's violation 8 United States Code 1325. Seeking asylum is legal. If you want to seek asylum, you go through the port of entry, do it the legal way. The Attorney General of the United States has made that clear. Okay. Okay, so there you, there you go. You know what that is? That is... It appeals to emotion, appeals to feeling, talking points, all of that in a bundle coming right up against just facts and a, 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 a logical point of view. That the ICE director there, former ICE director, what he it's just it's just lot just common sense, logical, look, here's the deal type of approach. And when the when the one appeal smashes up against that, it's like a brick wall and it just falls to pieces. And so she just that, that was just a beautiful moment um, because she just disintegrated. She had all of her she had all of her her talking points. Oh, you're separating families. And he says, Yeah, well, that's what that's what happens when you arrest somebody. Of course we are. 
That's not the point. Okay, it's not. It's this isn't some ploy. Some uh, you know when when if you get arrested for DUI or something, you have your kids in the car. You're going to be separated from your children, and you're also going to be locked in a cage. And if you want to put it like that, of course, it's going to make it seem worse. But it's actually just it's a it's a what else are you going to do? Are you going to put the kid in in jail with the parent? That would be um, a heck of a lot worse than separating them. But when you're in a position where you've got somebody breaking the law and you need to detain them, there isn't any sort of happy or nice way to do it. It's it's kind of a lose lose regardless, um, a, lo- a lose lose for the person, especially who's being arrested. And if they've got kids, if they got a family, it's just going to make it even more difficult. But you still have to enforce the law, obviously. So I love that approach. That's a good approach, um, because look, it's he, he wasn't showboating. He wasn't trying to be uh, intentionally outrageous or provocative or anything. He was just like, here's the deal. All right. Um, I guess we're going to, well, I've got a bunch of emails I don't have time to get into, so I think we'll save them. I also wanted to, to mention, I think it's September, I want to say September 20th. I don't know, look it up, but there is this Facebook group, which I can't tell if it's serious or not. I can you just you can't tell anymore, especially online if people are being serious or if they're just crazy. Um, I mean, for the longest time, I the whole flat Earth thing. There's a flat Earth groups online and fr- flat Earth YouTube people. For the longest time, I really thought that all that stuff was ironic and people were just kidding around, and it was just sort of this inside joke. And uh, so I thought I, I could appreciate that. I can appreciate irony and. And then it took me a while before I realized, oh, wait, they're serious. People actually believe this. So it's a similar thing here where you've got a Facebook group with, uh, I don't know what the number is up now, but thousands of people who are claiming that they plan to storm Area 51 out in the desert in, uh, I believe, what is it, Nevada. Area 51, they plan to storm it um, so that they can discover the aliens that they believe are being kept at Area 51. The Facebook group, this, the, the description says, let's get them aliens. And it suggested that if they all run and they charge uh, Area 51, then they can't all be shot. Uh, the, the, the bullets won't be able to keep up with them, which, of course, is not true. Uh, I just would tell you that. So, as I said, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's I, I, I can't tell if these people are sincere or not. I, mean, I hope they're, they aren't because if a, if, if a thousand people do storm Area 51, you're going to have a thousand dead people and nobody wants to see that. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll also say this. Listen, as, as fun as it is to think that aliens have visited Earth and the, 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 the government is, is hiding you know, the information about these aliens, as, I, I, it's, I like to think, about, to think that that's true too because it's a fun thing to think. It makes you feel like you're living in a movie. But I got to tell you, if you're planning on storming Area 51, I'm just, spoiler alert, um, they don't have aliens. Which, as far as you're concerned, they're definitely not going to have aliens because you're going to be killed in the process. So that you'll never see them even if they do have them. But um, in any case, they don't have them. They don't have the aliens. And I know that for two reasons. Number one, this is the main thing. And this is one of the reasons why all the conspiracy theories about oh, the, 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 the government did 9-11, the government faked the moon landing, the government, all this stuff. I know that all of that is false because, number one, it's just self-evidently absurd and stupid, and I have common sense. But number two, our government is not nearly competent enough to coordinate these conspiracies and keep all these secrets. I mean, you see how things are just leaking out of the Trump administration constantly, out of every presidential administration. There are constant leaks and everything happening. Do um, you really think, I mean, Area 51 has been there for, for decades. So that means that thousands of people probably not only know about the aliens, but have seen the aliens. And at this point, there's been no leaked information. No no uh, video or, or photos have made it out. No, just... Uh, our government, again, is not nearly competent enough to keep a secret like that for so long. And then number two also, um, I do think there are aliens out there, but 
uh, they have never made it to earth. They never will. The distances are just too great. There is no technology. I mean, in, in science fiction, there's technology. In reality, there just probably cannot ever be um, technology that would traverse the distances you would need to traverse in order for one civilized planet to encounter um, another civilized planet. I mean, we're talking about light years. Traveling at the speed of light is impossible. Traveling beyond the speed of light is definitely impossible. But even if you were traveling at the speed of light, which again is impossible, it would still take you probably hundreds of years in a spaceship to get to a planet that potentially has uh, other intelligent life. It's never going to happen. So um, we're alone as far as as far as we're concerned. We are alone on Earth. Don't go getting yourself shot over it. I understand the appeal, not of getting shot, but of wanting to see Area 51. Um, but uh, um, don't do it. That's my recommendation. All right. We will leave it there. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for listening. Godspeed. Hey, everyone. It's Andrew Clavin, host of The Andrew Clavin Show. Our president, Donald Trump, is acting like a jerk again. The never-Trumpers clutch their pearls. The pro-Trumpers thump their chests. But with the Democrats swiftly becoming an anti-American, anti-freedom, anti-prosperity party, we need Trump to win in 2020. So it's wise to ask, how much jerk is too much jerk? We'll ask on The Andrew Clavin Show. I'm Andrew Clavin.